Hey y'all, I'm Sunny Shell, and tonight we're going to talk about malleable memories with Dr. Elizabeth Loftus. She works in the Department of Psychology and, Crim and Criminology, two departments, and the Law School of the University of California at Irvine. The Review of General Psychology describes her as the most influential female psychologist of the 20th century. Her work focuses on malleability and reliability of memory. The New Yorker wrote, her work helped usher in a paradigm shift, rendering obsolete the archival model of memory. She's written 24 books and more than 600 papers and appeared on countless talk shows, including the Oprah Winfrey Show, and has presented on TED Talk. I'm so excited to have her. So sit back, buckle up, and let's get on to the sunny spot. Hey everyone, I'm so glad you could join me again today. I want to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Loftus, Loftus and uh, I'll call you Professor or Elizabeth, um, whichever one that you would prefer. Um, hey, we're really, one. we're okay. so excited to have you here. And to, to get started, I wanted to just ask you a very broad question. Um, what got you into the field of psychology to begin with? Into the field of psychology, I have to go way back because... <laughs> I, I was um, going to UCLA as an undergraduate. I was a mathematics major. I was, um, I loved geometry. I loved algebra. I loved trigonometry. When I got to calculus, I, I, um, I wasn't too excited about calculus, but I was sticking with my math because I worked at it so hard. And I, we had to take some electives, so I took introductory psychology, and I absolutely loved it. Uh, Alan Parducci was the name of my professor. I can't even remember exactly why I loved it so much, but, um, you know, about people and, and ideas. And it, so I started taking more psychology, and by the time uh, it, it was time for graduation, I had enough credits for a double major in math and psychology, and that... That was the beginning. Wow, that's um, I can really relate to that because I have um, I have a degree in psychology and political science, and it was kind of the same way for me when I took psychology courses. It just it it was like it opened up something whole and new. But I also loved politics, so all of a sudden it's like if you stay an extra semester, you can get them both. <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah. Well, and and um, there are some ways to combine them both, especially. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. There's what I do is um, I work. Um, I run a nonprofit that um, helps children who have been abused, um, sexually and physically abused. So, and that takes a lot of uh, both politics and psychology. So, <laughs> okay, well, it's, it's going to be interesting that you want to talk to me. Yeah, I, I do. Sometimes on, um, you know, um, on opposite sides of a court case, maybe. That's true, but it, I think it's important for us always to get a broad perspective on things because um, the, there's not a a, um, a my way or a your way or an, or a, a white or black. There's shades of gray, and it it's important to learn all about everything, really. And and I do deal in a lot in um, memories. A lot of times, it's short term memories because the kids that come to us, um, it just happened or it happened within the last year or so. I don't deal with adults who um, who suddenly remember uh, something that happened to them. And, and so that's kind of where um, where I think that your field m tends to go into is the repressed memories of the of adults. Is that correct? Oh, well, that that's that, you know, that's one area where the, the memory science has has been applied. But but anybody recalling something from a week ago or a month ago or a year ago, um, there's a memory issue to think about. Right, that's true. So how did memories become the focus of your work? So, um, well, continuing with the answer to my early, your earlier question. <laughs> um, so uh, there I was with my double degree in mathematics and psychology and um, Stanford had the 
basically the top program in mathematical psychology. And I thought, well, that sounds like a perfect field for me. It would combine those, those two interests of mine. So I went to Stanford uh, to study mathematical psychology and for my PhD. But when, when I started digging into mathematical psychology, I, I just wasn't that enamored with it. <laughs> But I was going to stick with it because it seemed like it was, at least in name, the right thing for me to be working on. But while I was there, I started working with uh, a professor. Uh, I, I was taking his class I, I, and I was working with this professor who was doing a study of memory. And he said, would you like to, you know, help me join me in this project on memory? So I started working uh, his name was Jonathan Friedman. He was studying semantic memory, which is a very different kind of memory. It's memory for words and concepts, hmm. kind of your knowledge of the world. Um, knowing that um, Sacramento was the capital of California, that kind of knowledge of the world. Or that um, an animal that starts with the letter Z is a zebra. So I started working on this kind of memory with Professor Friedman, and I got very excited about the subject of memory. And I did those studies with uh, him in collaboration with him and then others for a few years. Uh, but then I, I thought, you know, I really want to study something that has a, a little bit more obvious practical applicability. So what might that be? And I thought, well, I know something about memory now. I've been working on it for a few years. I've always been interested in legal cases. How about the memory of witnesses to crimes and accidents and other kinds of legally important events? And that's what I started to study uh, a few years after I had left graduate school. Okay. That's that's interesting. Um, I can see exactly why, <laughs> at least for me, I, I probably the math, the uh, mathematical psychology would, would be a little dry, <laughs> whereas um, this is, is very fascinating. Something that, um, that I find really fascinating about it is that you can have two people in the same family experiencing the same thing, but they remember it completely differently. And so I, I'm kind of curious how how is it that you can that you study memories, um, and and oh that's the wrong one. So how how do you are you able to study memories themselves? So o over these years since I decided I wanted to study uh, the memory of people to to crimes and accidents, uh, I've developed a, a couple of paradigms for doing these kinds of studies. So in, in one of the paradigms, what, what we do very simply is we'll show people a simulated accident or a simulated crime, maybe a, an accident on, on film. Sometimes we'll stage live events in front of people. And afterwards, we test them about what they have seen. So we know what they really saw. Uh, we can test them and, and measure their accuracy and completeness. But the twist in my studies typically was in between the, the accident uh, and the test, we might supply people with some misinformation. So they may have seen an accident where a car goes through a, a yield sign and we supply them with the misinformation that it was a stop sign. Or, or they may see a crime where the bad guy is wearing a green jacket and we suggest to them it was a brown jacket. We can supply misinformation to witnesses. And what we find is that many people will pick up that misinformation, incorporate it into their memory. It causes a contamination, a transformation, a distortion in memory. So now you start remembering the event in, in, a, in a way that's a little different from the way it actually happened. That's an example of one of the paradigms that we've we've used hundreds of times and that other scientists are now using as well that so makes sense to me way. yeah that makes complete sense to me um and and i can see that um 
like, like I said, with, you know, two people who have li lived in the same home, experienced the same thing, and they remember things completely differently. What is it about our brains that, that does that? Why, do, why is it that our memories are so malleable, for lack of a better term? Well, first of all, we, we've established that this phenomenon can and does happen, that people will pick up misinformation and alter uh, what they think happened, alter, the, alter their memory. Um, and this happens out there in the real world when people have conversations with each other after an event is over, when they're interrogated by investigators who maybe have an agenda or a hypothesis about what happened and communicate that to the person they're interviewing, even if they do it inadvertently, uh, or people see news coverage about events, particularly if it's a high publicity event in which somebody gets interviewed and maybe they say something wrong and that can affect the people who hear that interview. Um, why? But when you ask the why question, I mean, are you asking, you know, why, why would, why would God or Darwin or whatever your theory is have built us with a memory that is so malleable? Um, that's a question that I can only speculate about, which I'm happy to do for you if that's the question you wanted the answer to. Well, I, I am curious about that because, um, I, and it's not just the, the why, why it does that, but what, what it, what is it about memories that that um, that don't stick in? You know, you kind of think of, or we've always thought of memories as kind of you you go go back and it's almost like you're watching a movie, but it's but it's not really that way. You're not really no, watching a movie. So and 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 so I'm just curious about how, well, why our brains are like that and how how it does that to us. I guess. Well, I I, I mean I don't know. I mean I cannot t talk to you about it at the level of chemistry, the cellular electrical activities that go on when we store bits and pieces of memory. Because I study, I study things behaviorally, but I, I tell you that um, I think over these many decades, uh, collectively, we in the field have established the, the malleability of memory and that, um, memory does not work like a video recorder. You don't just record the event and play it back. You, you what, what, ha, what, What's going on is something more constructive. When you're trying to retrieve something, you're actually pulling together sort of bits and pieces of experience, things that might have occurred at different times and places, and in some sense, constructing what, what feels like a memory. Okay. Okay. That Well, that... So do we ever have any real memory then of, of events? Uh, well, you know, even these false memories have bits and pieces of truth. I mean, I think, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're bits and pieces of, of authentic elements or authentic things that really did happen. And, and sometimes you can find corroboration that lets you know they're authentic. But mixed in with these bits of authentic memory are often little tidbits of fiction. Okay. Um, so how do we, how do we trust ourselves then? How how do we end up trusting our our memories? Is there is there a way we can test ourselves to find out if we are are remembering something correctly? Besides maybe asking someone who was there along with us, they may they may also remember it differently. That happens. And I, no, I think one of the lessons of this work is that without independent corroboration, you, you can't for sure know whether you're dealing with an authentic memory or one that is a product of some other process. You, you need that independent corroboration. Um, and, and the reason is that one of the things we know about false memories, once they're established, is people can be very confident about them. So you can't look and say, well, wait, I feel confident. People can be very detailed. So you can't sit there and say, well, I have a very detailed recollection. You can't uh, say, well, it's, uh, you know, look at the emotion. False memories can be felt with a great deal of emotion. In other words, false memories can have some of these same characteristics 
that we might want to use to tell us uh, that our memory is real. But you have to be careful because of the fact that false memories can, can frequently have those same characteristics. What about um, when you experience something that is impactful, not necessarily traumatic, it can be tra um, trauma, but it could be something that, that's just very, um, you know, when, when you say it's seared into my brain, you know, that kind of, of thing. If you experience things, don't, don't they some, sometimes kind of make a, a stronger connection with us to where we remember them a little clearer than things that just kind of float past us? Well, I, I, there is evidence that if something is an important, an important event, or maybe using your word, impactful event, that you're going to remember it better than an event that is um, kind of more trivial and le uh, less important. Uh, certainly psychologists would agree with that. But even some of the most important events in our lives um, to people have, have been shown to um, have error. So I'll, I'll give you one example. We, we've thought for a long time that there was something called flashbulb memories. So um, you're probably not old enough to remember uh, where you were when you heard that President Kennedy was assassinated. But many people, most people over, who were over the age of about eight at the time can tell you a little bit about where they were when this exceedingly important event happened in our society. And more recent examples are, where were you when you heard about 9-11? Mm -hmm. Or if you live in Sweden, where were you when you heard about the assassination of the prime minister? Uh, or for people in England, where were you when you heard about the, the death of Princess Diana? These kinds of things have been studied. If you ask people shortly after the event, they'll tell you one thing. Um, Oh, let's see, I, I was uh, in my dorm room at, at uh, the university and a, some other student came in and said, did you hear what happened? That's how I heard. But then you come back to them a year or two or three later. I want to ask you again, where were you when you heard that news, what you were doing? They'll, they'll give you a different story. They'll say, I, I first heard about it on television. So it's an example of even these these highly emotional public experiences um, can change and can end up um, as memory reports that have errors in them. So um, if, if someone remembers something very clearly and, and maybe you come back and ask them, uh, you know, two weeks later and they give the same, the same account is, is that indicative of a, of a factual memory, or is that could that still be a, a false one? Well, that, that, that I would trust that one more than if their story changed. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, I would trust that one more. Okay, so how do we go in uh, ha have a, a process of creating these false memories? As, as someone who uh, works, you know, with with children who have been abused, I want to make sure that I do not inadvertently do anything like that. So, what are some things we can do to maybe prevent ourselves from doing okay from well first i have to tell you a little bit more about the creation of false memories because i only told you about one paradigm uh, which is called the misinformation paradigm where people actually had an experience they saw the accident they saw the crime but they got exposed to some misinformation afterwards and now it distorted the details mm -hmm. of their memory for something they uh they actually did experience um, but there's another paradigm in this field, which is called the rich false memory paradigm, where there's no event to begin with, but we just start suggesting things to people about their childhood or about their more recent past. And we can get people to create entire memories for things that didn't happen. We can get them to believe and remember that they were lost in a shopping mall when they were five or six years old. Uh, or they were attacked by a vicious animal, or they nearly drowned and had to be rescued by a lifeguard, or they committed a crime as a teenager and it was serious enough the police came to investigate, 
all of these in different psychological studies have been created in the minds of otherwise ordinary healthy people. So, so how did we do it? How did we plant these rich false memories? And then I'll come back and talk to you about, you know, interviewing, uh, interviewing kids in the, in the work you, you do. If I were gonna try to plant a memory in you, Sonny, um, I, I would bring you in uh, and have a conversation with you. And I would tell you that, Sonny, we've, we've talked to your, your mother and she told us some things that happened to little Sonny when you were about five or six years old. We, we wanna ask you about the things your mother told us about. And if you don't remember, just, just say, I don't remember. And then we would but present to you a few true memories, things your mother told us really did happen when you were young, and then a completely made up story about how on one occasion you were in a shopping mall, you were near the pet store, all of a sudden you disappeared, you were gone for a long period of time. Uh, eventually an a older woman found you and brought you back to the family, you were crying. Um, so it's a scenario that we constructed with your family member, but it's completely made up. And through just a few suggestive interviews, uh, we originally got about a quarter of our sample to remember all or part uh, of this made up experience. Then others planted, using a similar methodology, planted false memories of, you know, having a, being attacked by an animal, nearly drowned, having an indoor or outdoor accident, or some of these other uh, rich false memories. So what this is suggesting is that with highly suggestive interviewing, it's possible to do this in these cases with adults, but also other investigators have done this with young children. Um, two psychologists from the East Coast, Cece and Bruck, uh, have planted lots of false memories in the minds of four to six years olds, things that were completely made up, but these youngsters could be led to insist that they happen. Yeah, um, that you just kind of reminded me of um, something that happened when I was growing up. The um, Well, my dad had always told us a story. Um, I, I, uh, it was, you know, very detailed. And uh, he told us, he really believed that this happened. And I actually could picture it in my head. Mm -hmm. And I relayed the story um, to my uncle and he said, but that, that didn't actually happen. And I said, no, it really did. I remember it. I remembered, I can even mm -hmm. still thinking about it. I remember the blue of the sky and the smell of the ocean and, you know, details that were very clear, but it wasn't actually a memory. It was something I had heard over and over. And, and one thing that I've often thought is that, especially with kids, when people talk to us, but I think adults do this too, when we're in a conversation and we're describing something, we have a tendency to, to try to picture it in our own minds. We try to, to develop the story in our heads so that we can um, understand better what they're telling us. And I, and I wonder if that's kind of the, the process of, of implanting these false memories is that we kind of inherently create the picture in our minds. I think that's, you know, possibly what's going on in many of these cases where people are constructing a, a, a picture, filling in gaps um, where, where there's emptiness and they want to tell a fuller story, being encouraged to tell a fuller story. Uh, and w which both, you know, the adult patients in therapy are often encouraged to do. And, and the young kids who are being interrogated about what happened in the daycare are being encouraged to do that they can produce those details that are are being asked for. So and, and it might, might involve for people who can trying to picture it. Yeah. Um, so do you, in order to plant these types of memories um, or any memory in, in someone else, do you have to be um, very detailed and, and explicit or is it something that you can do inadvertently? You, well, you can definitely do it in, inadvertently and people can do it to themselves. So there's, a, so there's this concept called auto-suggestion, 
where you, when you're trying to figure out what might have happened or what could have happened or what possibly happened, um, you can suggest things to yourself and and uh, take yourself through this constructive memory process without anybody else being involved. Hmm. Okay. So I'm curious then, have you found any evidence at all for for repre actual real, rep uh, either repressed memories or, um, or, well, I guess it is repressed memories. I was going to say, or, or memories that, that are triggered by an event, but that really is another form of a repressed memory, I suppose. Have you found any evidence of actual repressed memories? Well, this is, now this is going to be complicated. I spent three months teaching a course on this um, <laughs> at university, but let me just say, at the outset, that there is no question that people can be reminded of things that they haven't thought about in a long time. They, they, they get some retrieval cue or they get asked a question and they can be reminded of something that, that they haven't thought about for ages, even something that would, would have been pretty unpleasant um, that they haven't thought about for a long time. And you, you just have to go to a high school reunion and you can experience this <laughs> yourself. But this happens. That is ordinary forgetting and remembering. What is being claimed in these repressed memory cases is almost by definition too extreme to be explained by ordinary forgetting and remembering. And thus the, they invoke this idea of repression or massive repression or some other word to refer to the basic idea. Um, I've had cases where she uh, she claims that she was uh, raped between the ages of five and 16, many, many times repressed all these memories into the unconscious until she went into therapy and now has recovered these experiences that she says were repressed at the age of 18. Um, that's too extreme to be explained by ordinary forgetting and remembering. And for that, there is no credible scientific support. So my position has been, if there's, if there's support for the idea of ordinary forgetting and remembering, that's one thing. But if there's no support for this idea of massive repression, until we find such good support, I just don't think we should be locking people up in prison and throwing the key away, you know, based on an unsupported uh, scientific idea. Hmm. I, well, I agree with, I totally agree with you on that. Um, we definitely don't want to, to incarcerate or um, adjudicate anyone who does not deserve it. And I, and I think when it comes to memory, we already know that eyewitness testimony, like you were talking about earlier with the, with the car accident or something like that is the least reliable. And then we're talking about something that happened years ago, potentially years ago. Um, I, I remember, um, reading about a woman who, uh, she had been, she, she, there was a period in her life that she had very, it was very difficult for her to recall. And, um, she, you know, she was wishing that she could, uh, recall that period, but she could like nothing from, I, I don't know. I think it was like seven or eight until 12, something like that. And, she was walking through a store and saw a man and all of a sudden it like hit her and all these memories started flooding back to her. So in that case, she wasn't suggested by someone else, but you did say that you can suggest it to yourself. So I'm, I'm curious yes. about this one. All right. Well, I mean, I, I'd have a lot of questions about even that one. I mean, how do you know? People people can misremember the content of an experience, but they can also misremember their past remembering. So, you know, I've seen cases where people come up with a whole bunch of different stories about how they first remembered the thing hmm. that they're hmm. claiming they were a victim of. I got you. Where that one time they'll they'll say they they look their daughter in the eye, another time they'll tell somebody they were hypnotized. Uh then you find out that they were in lots of therapy. And so you're, 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 you're getting the final story from mm -hmm. this 
but I don't know what other stories there were before that one. Right. It, I, that's all I can even remember about it. It's been a long time since I've, <laughs> but I yeah. do remember that, that um, she was walking through a, through a store or something like that. And just that man, just all those memories came flooding back. And, you know, you, you make a, a very valid point. Um, I have no idea if she had therapy, if she was actively um, like looking at people trying to see is, you know, is that someone that would help me to remember or, you know, uh, looking for things and when we can look and cause things through it. You just like, just for instance, um, I have a, a green Kia. I never saw a green Kia until I got my car. Then all of a sudden you, you're focusing on it. So you think everybody's got a green Kia now. <laughs> so, oh, no, that's a, well, that's a common one where you start to see something that you, 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 you just bought and you start seeing it everywhere. You know, that, right. So I guess, Sonny, you're normal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, along the lines of the saw man in the department store, I mean, I, I, I've i had cases where that they say, you know, I, I, I saw a man and smelled that he smelled like Old Spice and that's the smell of the person who abused me, you know, and that brought back the memories. And you find out that the supposed perpetrator never, ever wore anything like Old Spice. So. Right. You've got to investigate even the nature of that supposed retrieval as well. So we have a question from the audience. Kat the Humanist asks, I'm curious about the difference of forgetting incidental things, but trauma-related things can seem to be burned into your mind or blocked out. That's, yeah, we were just talking. That's very, very good, uh, relevant to what well, we were just I talking can, about. At least I can say something to Kat if you if you want, want me to. Um, one thing... You know, yes, if something is upsetting, very upsetting, you, you, you're you going to store the gist of that event, maybe a, a couple of core details typically. But even these traumatic experiences can be subject to future contamination and distortion. Somebody once did a study where um, high school students saw somebody be badly, badly injured uh, on, on a football field. And... Uh, investigators were later able to add blood to the to the memory when there was no blood. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's that's just something to, to kind of keep in mind that even even these memories follow similar laws, they fade over time, they become increasingly susceptible to contamination. Um, even if they're, you know, overall, um, more accurately recalled than more more neutral experiences. Mm -hmm. So um, now I'm thinking. I'm kind of thinking more about ways that I can <laughs> that I can try to prevent myself as a professional from um, from doing this. One thing that we do is we have uh, protocols that we have to go by when we when we interview children. Um, well, that's very good because. When you take a look at what the kind of things that were going on in some of these old daycare cases that were very famous, where lots of kids ended up with these wild, bizarre stories that led to the prosecution of daycare workers and, and the jailing of daycare workers, many of these cases overturned now, or uh, as in McMartin uh, in California, the, one of the earliest big, big cases in California, the kinds of things that the, the, the highly suggestive interview, other kids are saying this. If you're smart, you'll say something like this too. Uh, if you say something like this, you'll you're be a good kid and we'll go get you a hamburger. I mean, there are all kinds of things that, that go on in some of these cases that lead these kids to these wild, bizarre, unsupported memories, sometimes veering into satanic ritual abuse that um, just hasn't been corroborated, and, but has still led to the destruction of innocent people and their families. Yes, I, re I remember hearing about that, reading about that when I was in college. And um, when I first started into this field, um, we in, you know, in different conferences that I would go to and groups that I would be in, we would talk a lot about, um, you know, how how to be both ethical. Um, you know, ethics is a, is a big thing. We don't want to cause harm. 
Um, but also, um, how do we, how can we be there for these kids and, you know, and allow them their voice? And so what we, with our protocols, basically we, we are very open. When I go into a room with a child, um, you know, I'll just talk to him about his day and, you know, what did you do today? And, you know, what are some things that you like to do on your free time? We're just kind of talking and getting to know them. And then um, we have ground rules that we set, um, such as um, if I ask you a question and you don't understand what I'm asking, tell me and I'll ask it another way. Um, if I uh, say something and I get it wrong, please tell me because I don't want to get anything wrong. You know, those kind of things. And then yeah, we just I ask like them. That. Yeah. The next thing we do is just ask them, uh, so why are you here today? And many times they'll say, well, you know, I'm here. Are you, you want me to, to, to talk to you about X, Y, or Z? And I said, well, tell me about that. What do you mean by that? You know, we always ask really broad, open questions. Um, ju just uh, kind of to keep them talking in a sense, you know, just to, to get them uh, to feel more comfortable talking, but without asking, we never ask, uh, we never ask any details uh, about the case as far as we know it. Um, and we don't um, introduce anyone to it. If uh, sometimes when they say, I don't know why I'm here, I'll say, okay, well, just tell me about your family. Who do you live with? And what do you, you know, tell me about them. Uh, you know, what's a funny, a funny thing that your mom does, you know, and get them, you know, so just going around and having just a, a conversation about their family, family, even if the person who is alleged to have victimized them isn't in the family, just to kind of, you know, because uh, a lot of times being with a strange adult can be scary. So uh, we, we practice more of that than we do of, of questioning. Our questions tend to be more of tell me, tell me more about that. Tell me all about that type of questions. And, and those open-ended questions are definitely a good idea because you get, you, you get more accurate information from people than the closed interrogatory mm -hmm. type of questions. Um, you might not get as complete an answer as you're hoping for. So you sometimes have to follow it up with some more specific questions. One of the things I see sometimes happening, and from what you're saying, it sounds like you're being pretty careful is, um, the person doing the questioning is is shows an interest in in some topics and not others. Mm, and yeah. shows an interest in hearing about the trauma or the abuse, but not nothing else. Shows an interest in just person A, but not anybody else, like mm -hmm. B or D. Uh, and and people can who are being interviewed can pick up who, who are you interested in? Who do you want to hear about? So that that is some a little bit of something to guard against. Yeah, um, uh, it's funny that you say that. I'll often go into the room, um, the observation room, because we're we're being observed um, by closed circuit television from another room, and I'll go in to ask, you know, uh, is there, you know, is there something I missed when they were talking? Because I'm thinking about the protocol. I want to make sure I'm following that protocol, and um, and I also have to keep my face very neutral. I can't even like nod my head. I have to be very stoic. You know, I just have to. Um, and so I'm focusing on all of that. And I might miss something that they said that's an open door to talk about. And so I'll go in and oftentimes I'll have, especially from law enforcement, they'll say, um, ask them about Joe Smith. And I'm like, I, I can't. I'm not going to ask them about Joe Smith. If they tell me about Joe Smith, I'll be glad to ask them. But I'm not going to introduce Joe Smith. They really want those details because law enforcement is very focused on, you know, what happened at this time and then what happened at this time. And I, ha I can't I can't do that. My protocol will not al allow us to do that. Um, we've had. Um, Can I ask you a question? Sunny? Yeah, sure. I'm curious about because, you know, Sometimes by the time the person gets to you for the interview, um, they've talked to lots of other people or they've had other things happen. And I, I think it might be important for somebody in your position to see if you can learn a little bit more about it. who have you talked to, what other kids, um, you know, what kinds of things have your, have your parents said to you? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times, when you're dealing with somebody who, who's innocent, um, I mean, when you're dealing with a case where an innocent person is being accused or 
somebody's being overcharged or over exaggerated about um, the, the, the damage was done before they walked into your door. Now you're, oh, you are so right. And uh, one of the things that I do is um, I ask them, did anyone talk to you about coming to see me today? Um, did anyone tell you what to say? I just flat out, did anyone tell you what to say? And I'll tell you the one, the ones that, uh, the, that bother me the most are the, um, the ones that have to do with custody uh, because it'll be like, I'll say, so did anyone talk to you about what to say to me today? Well, yeah, mommy told me, oh, well, tell me what mommy said. And then mm -hmm. I just, I do the same thing with that that I've done with everything else. So tell me all about that. And and what does that mean to you? I also um, talk to them about the words that they use. I say, you know, what does that mean to you? I may think it means something, but you may say it may, think it means something else. So what exactly do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. And I'll go in, into detail with the individual words that they use. Um, and I've found kids who have used a word, and then when you ask them what that means, they don't know. And that's a red oh, flag, too. So That's interesting. And, and, of course, the custody cases are where are the scariest because uh, I, I think, you know, many of my friends who work in, in work with children and do the kind of work that you do are, are, are you know, would say the biggest problems are in these custody. But when, when it's a vicious custody Mm -hmm. um, yes, absolutely. So what other things do you think that um, that maybe I should do as a professional or um, or in talking with other professionals like me that we can do to try to. We may not be able to prevent um, having I mean, I think that anything that we do could have a negative effect and, and we may not even recognize it, but what what can we do to try to minimize that and actually actually be a, a force for good instead of, you know, <laughs> creating trauma? Well, you know, generally when I, I, I when I've written articles or, or about what things that let's say therapists should do or interviewers in, in in your case, I try to team up with a clinician and jointly author these things. I because I'm a memory scientist, so I, I'm. I, 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 I'm not in the trenches treating people who were sexually abused. I'm, I'm kind of in the court cases, looking at where it's really gone awry. And, and I like to team up with the professionals to provide sort of advice. And usually I'm, I'm collaborating with a clinician in, in doing, and have written a number of articles with, with clinicians. So the, the only thing I focus on, because it's most relevant to my expertise, is the, the things not to do that, that are known to, um, are known to lead, are suggestive and are known to lead people to develop exaggerated, distorted, or completely false memories. And so, you know, don't be suggestive. That, that's <laughs> That's kind of the the advice. Um, I'm, I'm sure you don't do this, and you don't need to do this. But you know, another another area where um, the work that I and some others do is is sort of relevant to the legal system. Maybe not so much to your work is to the problem of false confessions, because it's the interviewing of people with aggressive methods that have led people to confess to crimes they didn't do. Mm -hmm. Many of them, you know, are teenagers, for example, who end up confessing to something they didn't, they didn't do. You know, take the Central Park Five, for example, or a, right. a other of the cases of known false confessions that you can find in the database of the Innocence Project in New York, where DNA testing has actually proven that these people are innocent and they falsely confess. So what happens in some of these cases is the person doing the interviewing lies to the individual that they're interviewing. They tell them, you know, we found your fingerprints at the scene or you flunked a polygraph or, you know, some stolen possession was found in your belongings. It's a big fat lie and they're, they're doing it because they want to get the person to confess. But that's exactly the kind of thing you can do to get somebody to start to think that maybe they did it. Mm -hmm. 
And we right. know that suggestive things can uh, get people to even confess to crimes they didn't do. So I think this lying is uh, is a really bad idea. I completely agree with you. And and I've seen, I haven't seen it, it myself personally, but I have watched um, interviews that were taped where, especially with teenagers, that that's, um, I just, I don't like that. We do interview teenagers, um, but not like that. <laughs> we we interview them the same way we interview a little kid um, b- because they, you know, their brains are still developing and we don't want to do anything. Uh, we also do with um, developmentally, severely developmentally delayed adults who, who may, may be 25, but their mental capacity is a 12. We do the same thing. We talk to them in the same way we do the little ones. And it, and it, um, I think it gives them some uh, compassion and respect as well. It sounds funny to say that, but it really is because you're meeting them where they are. Um, But it really bothers me. Some of those that I have seen where they have them in this, in the interview room for for hours and hours. Oh Um, yeah. And sometimes they're hungry or they are tired or they, <laughs> or it's the middle of the night. Um, it's, uh, some really crazy things have happened. Absolutely. So you mentioned about the cases that you have um, that you you've been involved with, and I know some of them have been very controversial. And it must have been very difficult for you to be a part of those because, as you say, you uh, you know it's, it, we're innocent until proven guilty, um, and um, there is the suggestibility that comes in. Um, and people deserve to have someone who is speaking for them and on a professional level and talking about this, but that has got to be very difficult, I'm sure. Well, I, I, I guess I can talk a little bit about that. Just to give you a little history, I've, you know, I first testified in a trial back in the 1970s. And so over these many decades, I've, I've been involved in testifying in, in murder cases, in robbery cases, in some sex abuse cases, in, in many other kinds of cases as well. Civil cases involving auto accidents and where the physical evidence and the eyewitness testimony might contradict each other. Or medical malpractice cases where the doctor is remembering telling the patient one thing and the patient is claiming the doctor said something else or securities fraud cases where the broker made a promise according to the buyer, um, but uh, the broker denies making that promise. There, there's so many memory issues in lots of cases. Um, I've, I've worked on a few cases where of people you have heard of, famous, famous people, um, and, and then many people that you have never heard of, uh, some of whom I would bet my house are, are innocent. But I haven't had as much backlash about all those uh, kind of years of involvement in legal cases as I've had recently when I've testified for some pretty um, unpopular people. And, and I'm talking about people like Glenn Maxwell, who um, mm. was accused of, of being, you know, Jeffrey Epstein's sidekick and doing certain things to individuals, or Harvey Weinstein in, in his New York case. Um, and, you know, people don't realize, it. like, in those two cases, for example, I just talked about general, general information about memory, general information about memory distortion, um, no mention of any specific people, no mention of any specific suggestive things, uh, just the, the basics of, of, of the malleable nature of memory. And yet it created, you know, such hostility. People, you know, the, out there in the public were madder that I would be involved in a case like this than be involved in, in the case of Timothy McVeigh, who was, who was, did the Oklahoma bombing, or even Ted Bundy, who, uh, I wasn't involved in his murder cases, but in one of his er- his early case when he was still a law student and was accused of an aggravated kidnapping in Utah. So, and it, okay, it's one thing for people to, you know, be irritated and not realize that I'm not calling these people liars and 
not even mentioning them in some of these cases. Um, but when when a, a, another a, a law school professor starts screaming at me at a faculty meeting, uh, how could you? How could you? I'm done with you. I mean, I say to myself, wait a minute. I mean, you, a law professor, didn't you learn somewhere along the way that we have due process, that people are innocent till proven guilty, that that if if a, if an unpopular person doesn't deserve a defense, then a nice guy next time isn't going to get one, and an innocent guy the time after that won't get one. So it, it's it's been a little distressing having to to deal with some of these uh, reactions. I can only imagine. Um, I read the um, the New York Times. The, I mean, the New Yorker article, and that author was fantastic and how they went they they just made it very real as i'm reading through it and they described how how kind of ostracized you had been i mean you even uh, if i remember right um you were supposed to speak at a at a university and you had even bought your plane tickets and then they they said, "I'm sorry if, for with no explanation. No, you're not gonna. We can, we have to revoke it or or whatever. Cancel your speech." Well, no, well, that was close. Except, uh, you know, oh yeah, that happened um, the, the day before I was to testify as an expert witness in in the New York uh, case involving Harvey Weinstein, um, which is a case, by the way, where he was found guilty of of some of the things he was charged with, but. Uh, not guilty, you know, not found guilty of, of other things. And, and that's what you have to realize that sometimes people did some bad things, or even if they did some bad things, it doesn't mean they did every single thing uh, that they've been accused of. Uh, but still, the day before, there was some publicity uh, about um, my upcoming testimony in the trial, and uh, I got canceled by... Uh, for a big deal lecture that I was supposed to give a few months later, where yes, the airline tickets had been purchased, um, you know, by the university it was all set up. the The plan was in place, had been planned for a while, but uh, I got told unforeseen circumstances we're going to have to cancel that lecture. And um, when I tried to say, "Well, what's the reason?" Uh, I didn't get an answer. And when I try it again, it, it, and it asked very explicitly, is it because of this trial testimony? No answer. Wow. Um, inside sources have told me that somebody complained that we can't we can't be having her give this prestigious lecture um, when she's willing to testify in this case. And I just I, you know just shake my head and say, hey, we have a democracy where we got innocent till proven guilty. Even unpopular people to deserve a defense. What right. is the matter with you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm familiar, very familiar with uh, defense attor attorneys often getting um, expert witnesses for all kinds of things. And and you being an expert witness does not mean that you're necessarily there to say that Weinstein is is innocent. You're not there to say that Weinstein is a great person. You're you're there talking about that specific that that thing that you're that you're talking about that you're an expert about. You know whether it's you or, or whoever else. You're there testifying to the um, the nature of of the case, not the person. <laughs> and I think people forget that. Yeah. Um, you know some some other quite hated people have uh, ended up uh, ended up. Um, not being guilty of what they're accused of, I'm, and, but I'm not. I'm not saying that one way or another. Although I, I do have to say that um, some of the experts on the other side are, are more than happy to say I believe these memories are real in one way or another. Mm. Wow. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know exactly how you you um, how you do it. How you're able to <laughs> to continue doing that. So that's a tough, a tough thing to do to, to stand. Well, but, you know, but the way, you know, the way, I, you know, when these slings and arrows are coming, I have, you know, I've figured out some ways to cope with, uh, and one of them is, uh, I do have a lot of grateful people who, who write me 
letters or send me emails and just thank me for saving their lives or whatever. And I, I save those. I have a, I have a when blue fly, file, when blue, when I feel blow, when blue files on my you know computer. And mm -hmm. if it comes in snail mail, which not that much does these days, but <laughs> Then we we save the hard copy, and I, so I can I can go over these things and remind myself of of um, why I'm doing what I'm doing. Also, there there are quite a few other many other people who are very concerned about injustices and overreach um, that are my friends, acquaintances, fellow colleagues that I can talk with. So there, you know, I'm not, it's not like I'm just sitting here all by myself having to cope with the <laughs> slings and arrows. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Uh, so we're getting close to the end of the show and, and you definitely said you had a hard stop. And so I want to be respectful of your time. I would like to ask you just a few more quick questions. Um, what are you currently working on? If you can tell. <laughs> um, well, let's see. I have to, I have to, um, I'll be a little careful because I don't want to ruin the ability of my experiments to, to work by, <laughs> by announcing in a big public place where some people might learn about what our hypotheses are and just wreck the experiment. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm more, I'm, I have a few projects going on right now. Uh, I've got a collaboration, collaborations with other scientists and other places. For example, in Ireland, um, Gillian Murphy, a young uh, memory scientist there, has been uh, a collaborator, and we've just been working on a. We've just oh, you'll like this because of your poli sci background and your interest in politics. But we've been interested in push polling. Mm. You know, push polling where you know people do these polls where they don't even care what the answer is; they just want to. Yeah the recipient with some negative information about oh, the yeah. yes uh, well so we've been studying push polling it's it's often a kind of misinformation if, i mean mm -hmm. if you're if you're calling people and saying i want to see who you're going to vote for and and then you you say to them you know would it make a difference if i if you were to learn that uh this candidate was guilty of tax evasion well would that would that change your mind I mean, you're not saying they were, I mean, but you're insinuating something that mm -hmm. is true. And so our paper shows that people will pick up on these insinuations and it'll affect uh, how they judge the candidate. A, a, a somewhat different kind of misinformation that I think is kind of dangerous. And something like this went on uh, in, a, in an, for example, in an election that, that, that involved John McCain, where Hmm. People did push polling. Um, would, would it make a difference if I, if you were to learn that he he fathered an illegitimate black child? That was the push poll. They're very cheap polls because you don't care about the answer and you don't need to tabulate. <laughs> right. Yep. The results. Because all you want to do is 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 contaminate, and and then it ends up that the McCain's had adopted a little orphan from Africa and raised the orphan. Yeah, he did father, I, I guess you could say, you know, <laughs> little black child who didn't have married parents. But so uh, th there are lots of other situations where misinformation is infecting people in our society. Mm -hmm. Information in social media about COVID, about climate change, about all kinds of things. And, and we're beginning to look at some of that. Yeah, absolutely. It takes our our own cognitive dissonance, our own personal biases, and it puts it on steroids. It kind of it feels uh, seems like it divides us even more. I want to thank you so much for coming on with me tonight um, My pleasure. and taking the time out of your very busy schedule. Um, for those of you that are watching, I hope that you enjoyed it as much as as us. <laughs> um, if you're a patron. Um, I want to thank you. I have um, our current patrons are um, Deneen Murphy, Dan D, who also was a super chat tonight. Thank you. Michael Wiseman, Kathy Cotton, Cindy Plaza, Aaron Colson, Phil Calderon, Deborah Grace, and myself. I want to thank our producers, Wes, Phil, and Kat, and the booking team, Wes, Raymond, Ellie, and Correa. 
Don't forget our other shows. We have Secular Soapbox, Women Atheists Unload, Global Atheist, and The Bible Says What. So we always have something fun on here. Um, mine tends to be the science show. So I appreciate um, all of you who continue to watch. And remember, always think critically. Good night, everybody.